Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, thanks for joining everyone. Appreciate taking the time out of your day this afternoon. Um, my name is Cy Kilborn, coming to you live from South Boston. Uh, we've also got Sarah and Alex on the line from the East and West Coast. Um, I, a little bit about myself, I lead the engineering team here at Ecotrope. Uh, I've been with the company for 10 years, also been on the ResNet board of directors for uh, five years, and uh, just have been around the energy efficient product space, um, working with energy raters, builders, um, you know, building product manufacturers, finance teams, et cetera. So I have a pretty good uh, overview of knowledge about energy efficient products in the residential new construction space. Uh, if you haven't heard of Ecotrope, that's okay. Uh, I will give a very brief introduction to our company here, just a couple of minutes. So Ecotrope makes the most popular energy analysis software in the U.S. residential new construction market. Uh, so we're used by about one in four homes nationwide. Um, that also covers about 80% of HERS rated homes, which is around 250,000 homes per year. And our database is around uh, roughly a million homes at this point. We also uh, coordinate utility programs nationwide. So over 30 different utility programs where utilities are providing incentives for builders to build energy efficient homes. Uh, and we have partnerships with raters and builders and lenders, as well as uh, manufacturers of uh, energy efficient products. Our clients typically use us for certifications. So HERS ratings, but also code compliance, Energy Star, approving uh, compliance to a certain standard, uh, as well as insights, you know, the impact of certain products on energy efficiency, industry data, so what's going on in the industry, what, uh, how are new homes being constructed, et cetera, and sales and marketing support to help target sales and marketing and, and provide uh, more effective messaging for energy-related products to builders. So that's a brief bit about us. We'll go ahead and jump right into the content of the webinar and just uh, for an overall focus to, to get everyone in the right context. We're gonna be talking about energy related products in new residential construction. So that's the focus for today. There's certainly other uh, topics around energy efficiency, but we're talking about residential new construction. And uh, we want to one, provide insights into the market. So how to think, how do builders think about energy efficiency, what tools are available for sales and marketing, as well as uh, try to assist in developing effective sales and marketing strategy, as well as product development. You know, what do you need to do to um, develop products over the next three to five years to stay relevant in the market? As far as an agenda for today, uh, we'll first talk about the industry, some of the dynamics and problems. Then I'll talk through uh, both incentives, so what's available in terms of financial incentives for energy efficiency, as well as codes. Uh, so what requirements are there for builders to build to a certain threshold? Uh, and then uh, we'll also explore some data about how homes are being built today. And then um, wanna talk about a few success patterns that we've seen, strategies that have been effective. And then finally, how Ecotrope can help with all of this. So let's start with the industry, talk about some of the dynamics at play. Um, I'm gonna share what I have learned about the builder's perspective. Now, all builders are different. Um, yeah, I, I hate to categorize people or companies into kind of one bucket, but um, we're here, so that's what I'm going to do briefly, and and hope uh, you know hope everyone understands that it, that builders are always different. But from what I've seen, this is roughly in order what's important to builders when it comes to products related to energy efficiency. So number one is cost. Maybe not a big mystery to people, but um, you know cost, and I'm lumping in incentives as well because that helps offset the cost, but that's obviously a critical variable when it comes to building homes. Builders need to keep costs low. Um, next is risk and liability. 
So uh, any change that a builder is going to make to how they build a home is going to introduce risk. It doesn't matter what the product is, what the change is. If you're doing something different than what you're doing today. There's risk involved. Um, there's uncertainty involved. And so that's uh, an inherent challenge when you're talking about selling energy efficient products because it is change. Third would be codes and regulations. So how do the homes need to be built in a certain uh, region or locality? Um, then buildability and consistency. It's really critical for builders to, to have consistency in spec, you know, to build all homes in a certain community or a certain region in a very similar way rather than customized, uh, as well as to reduce build steps and reduce complexities and training barriers. Uh, with the labor turnovers uh, and labor shortages, you know, any, anything that requires a lot of training uh, introduces a lot of difficulties for the build cycle. So keeping things very uh, buildable and consistent has a lot of value. Finally, uh, market, or sorry, not quite finally, but market uh, preferences, consumer preferences. Um, you know, this is kind of different in every region. What do the consumers care about? Uh, example, you know, uh, in some markets have not really embraced heat pumps yet, even though, um, you know, they're actually really great products and very reliable. Consumers see a heat pump and, and uh, sometimes feel like it won't provide adequate heat. So, that's been a barrier to entry for those types of products. And then finally, energy efficiency. So, you know, some builders care a lot about energy efficiency, um, but many of them, this is pretty low down the priority list. And so the, the task that we have uh, when selling energy related products, is how do we move up the value list? Um, how, how do we start to frame these products in a, in a way that really resonates with builders and, and start talking about the benefits that are very important uh, to those builders. So just kind of moving up this prioritized list. And there's other things here, you know, comfort uh, and, and the overall quality of the home that are also important. So this is a simplification. But talking about the industry and where we are today, um, you know, new construction, is very complex when you start to think about energy efficiency. Um, there's all sorts of different regional programs. Um, a lot of things are performance-based and require modeling, so it's not, uh, it's not cut and dried in terms of what products are going to provide what benefits. Um, and you know, there aren't too many people that really understand all the ins and outs of energy efficiency nationally, right? And so the, the tendency is to try to simplify this, um, to try to condense it into more generic claims. Um, you know, some of the examples you see on the right there in terms of percentage of savings and dollar savings per year and that, and that type of stuff, which makes sense, you know, from a marketing perspective, you need to have some kind of generic messaging. Um, but there's also a missed opportunity if we don't go deeper um, the complexity in this industry actually provides opportunity if we can understand it and grasp it and leverage it for marketing and sales. Um, so uh, that's kind of one of the problems is that it's difficult to get to that complex layer. And, you know, builders are getting hundreds of marketing impressions each week, emails from all sorts of product vendors, everyone trying to push their product as something that's going to help the builder build a better home. And you know, with all this sort of generic messaging, it's very difficult to cut through the noise. Uh, and, and all of this messaging that builders get doesn't really provide them all of the information that they need to make a decision. Um, th this, this stuff kind of gets lost in the noise. They don't know how to apply a, a generic marketing um, you know, claim against their specific portfolio and the impact it will have for that builder. And so while that's the problem, it's also an opportunity because if you're able to do that, it will get the builder's attention. So just a quick example of kind of where I think we're, we're falling short here. Take heat pump water heaters, um, you know, really interesting technology, gaining, gaining some market traction, but uh, you know, these numbers are pulled from our database of new construction homes. We're seeing adoption rate nationally for heat pump water heaters at 2.3%, extremely low. 
Uh, in North Carolina, which I pull out uh, for a reason I'll go into a minute, we're seeing 7% adoption, so much higher, but still pretty low, under 10%. Um, and if we look at North Carolina specifically, there's a, um, you know, the extra cost of a heat pump water heater is somewhere maybe in the range of $800 to $1,000. Um, depends on what the builder is using today, but, you know, that, that is probably in the ballpark. And in Raleigh, in North Carolina, there is a rebate program where in many cases, a builder can get up to 1,700 additional rebate dollars for installing this e-pump water heater. So um, we're talking about a net benefit to the builder of 700 to $900 and improving the efficiency of their home and putting in a higher performance product. So uh, that seems like a no brainer to me, but yet we're still at 7% adoption. So what's going on? You know, I think there's a lack of awareness. I think there's missed marketing and sales opportunities. Like I said, people not uh, understanding those rebates and what's available and how to, how to sell and market with them. I spoke to a builder that builds in North Carolina and they said, yeah, we're interested in heat pump water heaters, but we don't really, um, you know, we haven't really looked in depth at how they would impact our portfolio. So builders just don't have the information that they need in many cases. There's also, a, like I mentioned, a aversion to risk, aversion to change, which is something that we need to uh, overcome. So continuing on, you know, what's available in the market, we've got incentives and regulations. So it's the carrot and the stick. Uh, I'll talk about some of the most important uh, of these incentives and regulations that uh, everyone in the industry should know about. So in general, there's two different types of both incentives and regulations. There's prescriptive, which are typically checklist-based. These are gonna be simpler, not gonna require energy modeling to uh, prove compliance. And when you talk about energy codes, uh, typically gonna be more rigid. If you take the prescriptive approach, you have to follow these items. You don't have flexibility to, to deviate from the list. And if you talk about incentives, uh, usually because of the simplicity, incentive amounts are going to be a little bit smaller. So that's kind of the trade-off. When you talk about performance uh, incentives and regulations, you know, these are looking at the whole home and analyzing it to see how it performs uh, as a system. So this is going to require energy modeling, typically a HERS rating. That's the most common for new homes. It's uh, for code compliance, it's going to give the builder a bit more flexibility. Uh, they can trade things off, you know, uh, trade off improvement here for uh, relaxing a spec here. It's also, when you talk about incentives, going to provide usually higher value incentives um, because of, you know, that added complexity, added detail and accuracy, more incentives are available. And finally, it's much less understood. It's, um, it's, a, it's a more complex thing. It's, it's a bit opaque to, to understand how, uh, how things interact in the performance modeling world. And so, you know, there's opportunity there as well. So I'm gonna focus mainly on the performance side of things for this conversation. I think it's, uh, there's, there's more opportunity to improve from, from learning from that side. So starting with incentives, a few key incentives that I wanna highlight. The first one is the 45L tax credit. If you're selling energy related products in this industry, without uh, understanding the 45L tax credit, you may be missing out on some opportunity. Um, so the current status as the legislation is today is uh, that a home that achieves 50% lower heating and cooling loads than a standard 2006 home is eligible for $2,000. $2,000 per home for a, a builder that builds at scale is a whole lot of money. So these rebates are, or these tax credits are very important to them. Uh, and a couple of things to note about this as it currently stands, water heating, lighting, appliances, et cetera, you don't get credit for that as a builder. So it's kind of a, a blind spot of the incentive. Uh, it's only heating and cooling. And there are also some loopholes that builders can leverage to be able to access this credit without doing a HERS rating. Uh, many of the top builders today are claiming the credit on 90% or more of the homes that they build. So they're getting a really massive amount of these tax credits. Um, and th those are some of the problems with that credit today. 
The good news is uh, this credit is going to be most likely updated in 2022 as part of the Build Back Better uh, legislative package. It's going to be bumped up to $2,500 and the compliance requirement will be Energy Star 3.1. And then there will be a tier two of $5,000 for homes that meet DOE zero energy ready. So both of those are EPA uh, DOE regulated programs. There's a very clear modeling path and QA oversight that needs to happen for the home. Uh, it will require a HERS rating. And the good news here is that all components now come into play, lighting, water heating, appliances, all that stuff is critical. Um, and uh, we're also going to be kind of eliminating that loophole. And so, you know, many builders are going to see a really substantial drop in terms of passing rate for this credit. And there's going to be, I think, some sticker shock in 2022 when, uh, you know, we're not able to see as many credits claimed for some of these builders. And they're going to be looking for opportunities to recapture some of those tax credits. Um, and so, this is a great. Uh, a great incentive to leverage when you talk about uh, your energy efficient products and why it will benefit builders. Second incentive is utility rebates. Um, these are all over the country and the difficulty is that they're different everywhere. So they're state by state, they're really uh, utility jurisdiction based. Uh, there's some roll ups in terms of whole state programs they can give anything from $100 per home to $25,000 per home uh, with a new program in Massachusetts for uh, electric uh, zero energy ready homes. So really wide range here, a lot of money potentially on the table. These require a HERS rating usually. Um, Ecotrope calculates the incentives for many of these programs. Uh, and you know this wall of text here is just some of the available utility programs. I won't go through all those names, um, needless to say, there are quite a few, and uh, the takeaway here is to really understand the region that you're selling into. Um, utility programs can be a powerful tool. They're not utilized enough, and so uh, make sure that you understand what's available. Uh, finally, I'll just touch on financial incentives, uh, financing incentives rather. So. Builders, uh, there's a new program from Fannie Mae in which participating builders can receive rebates for building Energy Star homes. Uh, it depends on the price of the home as well as the mortgage rate. So I'm not gonna go into super amounts of detail here, but uh, it's just a, another avenue of collecting these incentives for the builder to help um, get at the cost aspect, leveraging energy efficient products. Okay, and then the flip side of the coin is regulations. So um, these are really energy codes are the most important things to know about here. Um, most states and jurisdictions have adopted some version of the IECC, whether it's uh, one of the national publications that comes out every three years or an amended version of one of those. Um, you know, states will often change the air leakage rates or the um, you know, duct leakage rates or insulation requirements, et cetera. But you're gonna typically be working within these structures, which is good. You don't have to go and read uh, 50 different code books with completely different structures. Um, codes represent both a hurdle and a tool. So it's important to understand them and have a good, un a good lay of the land when it comes to how things are changing. So code stability, you know, when a code has been in place and is not changing in a certain area, it brings um, a bit of a hurdle because there's a version to change. Uh, it may have been painful for a builder to get into compliance with that code. Um, there may be some kind of scar tissue around that, some cost, um, some cost uh, you know, aspects. And anytime you talk about changing a spec, uh, if if it could bring code compliance into play, then there may be some aversion to change because the builders got something that's working. They don't want to disrupt that. Um, that won't necessarily be the case if you're talking about just a pure product improvement, but if you're talking about trading off one thing for another, code comes into play. Uh, it's also an opportunity. Uh, it can be a tool, especially when code is changing. Code changes bring, first of all, usually a requirement that builders change their spec. So 
So that's an opportunity while they're changing things to uh, you know promote the benefits of your product. And it also uh, brings disruption and pain and fear and risk and uh, builders are gonna be looking for solutions, looking for help. So they will be kind of um, more open to sales and marketing. So there's complexity here to understand the codes but there's also a huge opportunity um, just as kind of a current events type um, you know, issue here. IECC 2021 is very top of mind. Uh, it's just starting to be adopted by municipalities countrywide. And uh, it represents a pretty big change in terms of energy efficiency. So not gonna go into a ton of detail there, but just know that builders will need to change uh, and if we want to look at that in terms of data, you know, this is uh, all 50 states plus, uh, you know, territories. And the bars here represent uh, margin of passing rates on average for homes in that state uh, for IACC 2021. So states with bars above zero means on average homes are passing IACC 2021 in that state. Where the bars are below zero it means on average homes are failing. So everything with bars below zero here means the average home in that state is going to have to be built differently in order to meet IACC 2021. So huge opportunity here to, um, to, to help builders navigate that change and, and navigate their, what it means to their home portfolios. Okay, uh, let's change gears a little bit and explore some data. So um, I'm gonna ship shameless plug really for, for a product that we have at Ecotrope, which is our uh, business intelligence tool, market intelligence tool. Uh, we pull data from HERS ratings across the country and uh, provide that in the form of insights to product manufacturers. So I'm gonna drill into some of that data and show a product that we offer to product manufacturers in this space. Um, so I've switched over to our data dashboard here and let's just do a quick overview. Uh, I won't spend too much time here, but quick national overview. So what you're looking at is about 18 months of homes registered through Ecotrope. So we're looking at 400,000 homes. And uh, essentially this is where these homes are being built. So this is kind of a nice snapshot of the new construction market across the country. Um, big time construction in the in the southwest here, Texas, as well as Colorado, um, and then up the, you know, the Atlantic seaboard and, and some in the Midwest here. You notice not much in California. There is a lot of construction in California, but Ecotrope doesn't uh, process hers ratings in California at this point. So that's why the missing data there. Let's look at a few key insights from this dashboard. Um, first of all, we can look at the HERS index. So uh, the average and median HERS index is right around 58 with uh, most homes scoring, you know, in between 45 here and around 75 or 80. And you can see this really nice bell curve here. Um, we can also look at 45L. So as I mentioned, 45L is very important. Um, this is an interesting statistic because, you know, I talked about the builders having sometimes 90 plus percent pass rates because they're able to take advantage of alternative ways to meet that 45L tax credit. Uh, but if you look at the energy modeling route, we're seeing only 20% of homes pass the 45L tax credit. Um, so that's a, uh, that's a pretty um, big difference between 20% and 90%. Um, and I can also um, look forward to 2022, where I mentioned that Energy Star 3.1 and DOE Zero Energy Ready are going to be the new programs where uh, compliance means you can get those credits. Right now, we're seeing about a 25% pass rate for Energy Star 3.1 and only a 0.3%, so really tiny pass rate for DOE Zero, Zero Energy Ready. So we're gonna see some drop-offs probably for the big builders and compliance. Like I said, I think it's a big opportunity and um, you're gonna probably see these numbers go up. 
and uh, you know builders are going to be looking for help to figure out how to get those numbers up. Uh, okay, so I'm going to skip through a lot of this, but you know this is the same chart that I showed about uh, IACC performance. We can see how it measures up against the previous code, 2018. So the gray bars are 2018, pink is 2021. You can see how much lower all these bars are in the pink than in the gray. So it does represent a pretty significant change in terms of difficulty of compliance. So this is our codes and standards dashboard. Uh, this is all filterable by state and region. I'll show you some of that filtering on our next dashboard when we dig into actual construction practices across the US. So, um, you know, we see some of the same information here, but we can also see, um, you know, air leakage rates. Uh, what are the infiltration levels of these homes? Uh, we can see, you know, wall construction practices, what's being used in terms of continuous insulation, you know, mostly zero. We've got a couple of uh, R3, 4, and 4.2, but um, not a whole lot of continuous insulation. You can see the dominant cavity insulation for walls. Uh, 13, um, next is 15, and then 21. Uh, about, you know, two thirds roughly of homes use two by four construction, a little less than one third use two by six, and then a smattering of other things up here. Uh, dominant insulation material is really fiberglass insulation in the cavity. Um, you know, similar type information about ceiling and, and floors. And then we can also see what types of rebate programs are important. So this is a national picture. You can see all these different rebate programs. Like I mentioned, it's really scattered and there's a lot to understand. So it's useful to dig into a specific region. Um, and I, I'm gonna do that now actually. So let's just take a couple of potential use cases here for this data. Um, first, let's look at continuous wall insulation try to understand, you know, th this was the national picture of where homes are being built. Um, but let's, let's focus only on those homes that have continuous wall insulation that's significant, you know, in the three, four and 4.2 range. So I'm gonna highlight those and all the data on this dashboard will now update to reflect uh, what's going on with those homes. First, we can see that the percentage of two by four walls actually went up. So most of this, Continuous insulation is being used on uh, two by four walls. Um, but let's take a look at the national picture here. Shows a pretty interesting perspective. Totally different map here when we look at continuous insulation. Um, real hotspots are in the you know, Arizona, so Phoenix area, Las Vegas, a little bit in, uh, in the Midwest here, and then some in Texas. But you know, it, it's not super prevalent in most areas. Uh, and I think down here in the Southwest, you get a lot of stucco construction, which lends itself to this R4 um, rigid foam. So that's probably what we're seeing there uh, in that picture. Okay, let me clear that filter. And, um, you know, let's next take a, a quick look at how wall cavity insulation impacts 45L compliance. So. Here we've got the various levels of cavity insulation increasing as we go to the right. And uh, the, the kind of like dark green aqua section here is homes not meeting 45L. And then the light green section is homes meeting 45L. So as we move to the right here, we see this light green section continue to grow, uh, which means that, you know, maybe not surprisingly, it's easier for homes to pass 45L as they add cavity insulation. So if we start with 13, which was by far the dominant cavity insulation, looking at about a seven or 8% pass rate for 45L tax credit. Um, and then if we shift over here to an R21, which is also fairly common, we see it jump all the way up to a 40% pass rate. So that's uh, very meaningful when you average that across homes for a builder an extra 35% pass rate for 45L, that's like uh, six or $700 per home. So really helps to paint the picture for uh, using more insulation and maybe you know, moving towards a, a two by six construction. 
Okay, one final drill down. Let's uh, let's take a look at rebate programs. I'm going to dive right into Texas for now, and um, you know, so as I drill down, everything's going to update. We'll zoom into Texas, and uh, let me shoot down to our rebate program chart, and we can see really, you know, a much clearer picture of what's important in Texas. What are the rebate programs builders are participating in? Uh, center point energy by far the biggest volume here with this big circle and then we've got the energy program ap texas uh, and the tnm pro p program as well here in texas um, so it just helps you get an understanding of what's actually uh, going on in these states and you can drill down to metro areas as well okay let's jump back to the presentation here um, I uh, want to kind of wrap up a little bit, talk about some success patterns that we've seen. Uh, so one really key thing is arm yourself with knowledge about the market. So understand what's out there in terms of codes and regulations, uh, what incentives are available, how are builders currently building, you know, what's the current construction practices. Uh, and you need, you know, you need to have this information so you can get the attention of the builder at the right time. So leverage these things to help you sell in those markets. Um, you can also, it's really important to customize sales and marketing. You know, a generic marketing has its place, but uh, can you identify, you know, how does your product impact a specific region with more detail? How does it impact a specific builder with more detail? Uh, can we cut through the noise and, and get information that's more relevant to the people that need to make these decisions? that's kind of the trick that that's the key um, as well as moving up the value hierarchy can we start to position some of these products uh, as you know ways to improve things that are even more important to builders than energy efficiency can we frame them in a light that it actually reduces costs for the home that's that's the big winner uh, but also looking at you know regulations and risk reduction and marketability all that stuff is important so uh, it's important to focus on that and understand where your product falls uh, in those categories. And then finally, you know, target your efforts efficiently. Um, you know, pour marketing dollars into areas where you're going to have better success, maybe areas with higher incentives, maybe areas where your product has a better benefit, um, maybe builders specifically that will benefit most from, from your product. Uh, and the good news is that uh, we can help with all of this. Some of this you can do on your own, uh, some of it we can help with, all of it we can help with, with our data and our analytical capabilities. So um, we, are, we are here, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to talk about how we can collaborate. Um, but you know, on that topic, just a, a few different solutions that we offer to product manufacturers, I'll review them very briefly. Uh, the first one is market intelligence. So what I just showed you with that data portal, uh, we, we sell that as a subscription service. So being able to understand how homes are being built uh, across the country really helps you uh, just understand your market better. The second would be uh, smart search prospecting. So uh, we would you know, take a specific product and uh, run a virtual assessment across all of our data to help identify regions and builder segments that will benefit the most from that uh, product uh, and are therefore stronger prospects. So essentially build a prospecting list based on that information. The third would be scenario modeling. So when you're working with a specific builder or in a specific region, we can help really quantify the impact of your products by sort of virtually swapping them in and doing this analysis on real homes. Um, including potentially complex trade-off uh, scenarios. So really dialing in that message and value proposition to a specific builder or a specific region to cut through the noise and make it more relevant. Uh, finally would be embedded product recommendations. You know, uh, when beneficial, we can show uh, to our raters and builders, we can surface specific recommendations, show the benefits of specific products, so give you that um, ability to kind of uh, get your product into the uh, eyes of the people that need to uh, need to see it 
and, and might benefit from it. So those are really the key solutions that we offer. And overall, the value that we're providing here is uh, helping to inform marketing and sales decisions, you know, where to target resources, getting an optimal return, um, boosting efficiency overall of sales and marketing teams by really providing knowledge about uh, what's out there, uh, what the market conditions are like. Uh, helping with prospecting to sort of rank prospects and identify really good targets for regions or builders that might be more likely to purchase a specific product, um, as well as increasing the conversion rate of builders going from prospect to purchase um, by helping to customize that, uh, that value proposition and the, and the messaging and also quantify it for that specific builder for their portfolio. Um, and then, you know, finally, informing uh, two that are not really as related to sales and marketing. So one on the product development side, helping you uh, make sure that you're building the right products over the next three, five plus years uh, to be able to stay relevant in the industry, um, provide what the industry needs. And then finally, uh, providing uh, evidence to the policy and regulatory teams uh, to be able to uh, help with influencing and lobbying when it comes to policy and regulation. So all of that stuff Ecotrope can help with. Uh, we're, we're very excited to talk to folks. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be happy to, to take any sort of call and, and see if we can help. Um, I want to thank everybody for your time today. I want to make it um, you know, very clear. I I'm here if you want to reach out to me. My email is right there on the screen. Uh, you can also follow us on LinkedIn or go to our website. Um, and there's uh, several resources on there. And you can also contact us through the website. So uh, please reach out to us. We'd love to chat. Uh, and at that point, I'll close it up. I'll close my mouth for now and um, open it up for questions. So please use the chat feature. Uh, raise your hand and we'll be happy to run through some of these questions.